Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another edition of Heads Up Hockey. It is your boy, Jersey Joe, once again. And the World Juniors has concluded. The New Jersey Devils did just beat the New York Rangers in overtime. What about that irony? How about them apples after a few weeks of feeling the pain and uh, not enough gain? And the Devils did finally get a nice two-point win at the Rock. Yes. It was exciting to see your boy, two-time All-Star, Jack Hughes, get two goals. One to get the icebreaker. And most importantly, Jesper Bratt got off a cold spell and got a beautiful power play goal. And that really helped Jack Hughes get that tying goal. Now, I will say this along with other doubles podcasters that I've always given Damon Severson a lot of flack over the years because of his uh, defensive miscues. However, he has been redeeming himself a little bit, and the Devils inserted the young Russian defenseman Nikita Ohotuk uh, right into the lineup instead of playing Kevin Ball, because Ball has not been playing the most defensively sound, especially the last couple of games, and including the one against the Blues, and that owed the Devils a nice good two points there. So... The Devils get back on track, and I'm also looking forward to uh, the Devils getting Luke Hughes and Simon Nemec. Coming right out of the World Juniors, and you have uh, Luke Hughes who's on this mission to try and win the Frozen Four uh, championship with the Michigan Wolverines, and you will see this where Michigan has been drafting a lot of high-quality forwards and defensemen. And you'll see it this year, like I mentioned, Adam Fentilli, who played for Team Canada, uh, potentially going second overall. And definitely the next guy behind uh, Connor Bedard. And yes, I did say that Connor Bedard, to me, is... uh, this generation's Ilya Kovalchuk because he's going to be a faster version of Stamkos. Maybe a little bit similar skating-wise to uh, Kovalchuk, but maybe not anywhere as fast as Connor McDavid, but a far much better shot than McDavid. However, the Devils are not going to be shooting for those stars. Why? Because they are near the top of the league in the top 16, in the top 10, and they're not looking to tank or anything like that. No. This team, I mentioned it in a new article coming up on Pucks and Pitchforks. You'll see it. Likely tomorrow, because my editor-in-chief, Nick Villano, will do that uh, editing piece of mine. So, with that being said, I do have someone in the chat. Oh. That's just Riverside. Anyways, I want to go over is that the Devils have grown their prospect pool. And it has come to a point where they could actually move one of their pieces in a trade or two to improve the team. And I believe that will happen. And I spoke with a buddy of mine who's got close ties to the Devils. And... That buddy of mine is also someone who's a journalist. I can't say the name of the person. You know, that's a little bit of a long story. But I did ask the question, are the Devils going to add that finisher? And I heard in the text back, yes, they're looking at a finishing winger. However... The Devils are also valuing their key pieces. So they're not trying to mortgage the future. They're not trying to 
uh, lowball anyone. They're just trying to feel out the market. So with that being said, I was writing in recent articles saying the Devils are in a bye-bye situation. I mean, like, mad money Jim Cramer, like, bye, bye, bye. You know, that type of thing, you know. I'm talking with my hands because, you know, I'm expressing myself. Um, now I kind of want to talk a little bit about the prospects. So, like I said, Connor Bedard's likely going first overall. If you, if I was a betting person, and by the way, for those of you who don't know, Bet Stamp is there for all your betting needs. It's to track all the live odds, prop bets, stuff like that. You know, they got it all in one spot. And for those of you who are getting ready for the Super Bowl, the Stanley Cup, uh, March Madness, it's all there. Just make sure you bet responsibly. So, segueing back to the prospects, I really love Matvey Michkov, the way he plays a physical game. And he scores goals. Right now he's at the VHL, if not going into the KHL. I think the problem is that contract is till like, what, 2026? And not a lot of teams want to wait that long to get a high-end guy. So that makes me think a little cynical. And what do I mean by cynical? I think he would slip kind of like... Ivan Moroshnichenko, and some other team in the top 16 of that draft class will get very lucky. And if for some reason he goes through 5 or 10, that team's going to feel like they won the draft lottery. That's just me being the guy that says, you know, theoretically if you had a shorter contract with the KHL, that team would be happy to take him a lot sooner. So definitely contract and term does mean a lot. Ah, that's good matcha. Anyways, for those of you who don't know, I am a big fan of European and Russian players. And the problem with the whole... Russian aggression in Ukraine has also scared off some teams and I tend to think that the way these players are developed in that part of the woods they are highly skilled some of them have problems not as of recent committing to the NHL it's just that some of them like playing better in the KHL, but Michkov definitely wants to play. And he's going to be the next best forward since Ovechkin. I can see that. But he's going to be more of a bull. Very strong guy, big physical specimen. And I can see him going to a team in the top six easily. But if he does slip... Well, that's because of the complications of uh, being a young guy in the KHL and a long contract, more than so the Russian aggression. There were teams like the Devils last year where they found some of these uh, Russian prospects that slipped all the way through the early part of the draft to the end of the draft as well. And so they jumped on them. Like Artyom Barabosha... Uh, Daniel Orlov, just to name a few. Some of those guys I was actually high on. And I'd like to thank the Devil Scouting to do their due diligence. Now back to this year's draft class in 23. So Moose Jaw has a really good center in Braden Yeager for the Moose Jaw Warriors with 18 goals and 48 points. So that's 48 points in 38 games. That's more than a point a game. However, let me see his profile. If I'm not mistaken, he was with Team Canada. So let me double check. 
Yep. Rook of the Year in the CHL, Rook of the Year in the WHL, and won gold in the Klinka Gretzky gold medal. So, yeah. He is looking at going as high as fourth overall between uh, the Hockey News, Bob McKenzie, and all the way low as uh, 14 by Dauber Prospects and Elite Prospects. Uh, I tend to believe Bob McKenzie the most. I put more stock in Bob McKenzie than anything because he values the top 10 scouts every year in the preseason, early season, midway of the season, close to the end of the draft. Um, he gets closer and closer, so he starts, like, when he mentioned Uri Slavkovsky was at number one, that's likely because he had a scout from Montreal that told him so. So he was able to keep that quiet, uh, keeping that guy anonymous. So that's why people build a good reputation as those hockey insiders. Now, with that being said, I do really like the way uh, Leo Carlson is positioned to be. Uh, I like the way Sweden has created a lot of high-end, high-speed, uh, full-throttle type players. And he reminds me of a more raw version, yet being more developed like Jesper Bratt. The way he is now, now I can do a fair comparison of Leo Carlson by Jesper Bratt, which I think is a fair comparable because their play styles are similar. Yeah, Leo Carlson, Jesper Bratt, and, you know, the NHL is a copycat league. And I always find that teams that go, geez, I wish I drafted that player. I know I sound like about it a thousand times before, but it's worth mentioning again. So you take a look at Leo Carlson. He's six foot three. He's a center winger. Brat is a left wing right wing. Brat is five foot ten and 174 pounds. Leo Carlson six foot three, 194 pounds. So Carlson has a contract from twenty four to twenty five, so it's coming up quick. And Carlson is gonna go between three and five in the draft. <clears throat> and Bob McKenzie got him pegged at five. Now if you take a look at age by age, Jesper Bratt had at age 14 rather, better comparable. In the junior 18 division one, he had 24 points in 29 games. And at the under 16, Elite League, Leo Carlson had 10 and 19. So, Brad had a better year at a higher level. But it's not too far off. Jesper Brat had, at age 15, in the J18 Al Svenskan, the, the second tier, he had 18 points in 18 games. And... He went to the J18 Elite League. He had 16 points in 20 games. Now, you take a look at the U16. Uh, you look at Leo Carlson, 17 points in 15 games. Now, as we see, the J18s, Brat had 8 points internationally with Sweden. <clears throat> and another 
four points with the WHC 17 for Sweden's under-17 team. So he had 12 points total. And then Leo Carlson had nine points in 19 games compared to Jesper Bratz 40. So he's a little behind in the development, but he's come a long ways. So he's really starting to pop at a later age. So if you take a look, Leo Carlson really does pop more than Jesper Bratt. If you take away the international numbers of Bratt's 20, <clears throat> Bratt had 19 points altogether from his ju junior 20 Super League in the Hockey Al Svenskan. Uh, you look at uh, Leo Carlson, he has about 29 points in, four, in, in 51 games. So that's between the SHL with 9, the Junior 20 National with 27, and the J18 at 3. So really, when Carlson hit that J20 National, he really got noticed. And became very, you know, not so much pedestrian, but above average at the SHL level for a, for a rookie. That's actually pretty good. Now, you take a look at the SHL. Leo Carlson had 40 points in the SHL. Brad had 22 in the Elsvenskan. So that's the second tier below. So really, <clears throat> I tend to think that Leo Carlson's developed a little later. And the reason why I make that statement is because Brat, being born in July, he's actually ahead of Leo Carlson in December. They're not in, from the same birth year, but six... Six years apart, you look at Carlson, he's a late birthday, so he develops a little bit more physically uh, later on, and then he starts to really pick things up. Now, if I'm an NHL team, I'm thinking to myself, if this kid's available, do I go with him being a center? Or put him on the wing. Because I think if you put him on the wing, he could do all sorts of damage as well. But if you also make him a center, have him win the face-offs. And it is not problematic to have a guy from go center to wing. As long as he's able to win puck battles, outpace other teams, and skate fluidly, that's a good thing to have because we've seen it in New Jersey. We've seen it in Carolina where the Devils have a guy like Brad. The Rangers have a guy like Jesper Faust. I know Faust is an older player now, but when he was younger with the Rangers, he could outpace people. He could tire you out. You'll win more puck battles. And those are some things in today's NHL. You see more guys who are effortless skaters not get so fatigued. That's an important uh, benchmark to have in a skill of a player. So, yes, uh, Canada did win the gold over the Czechs. But, boy, the Czechs really kept the Canadians close. And the Americans versus... Uh, Sweden, that was the definition of a barn burner. Why? That was like more than 15 goals in the game. So, I don't know if anyone does any bets like that, but whoever did that, you made good. And uh, congrats to that person. Because if you predicted Canada for gold and you got... 
Czechia with silver and the U.S. with bronze, then you did a parlay. So congratulations to whoever did that. So I tend to think that if you're a fan of the Slovaks, uh, Guyon in net, he should definitely be an undrafted uh, goaltender. Maybe a late round goalie gets selected. And the way uh, he has played in this tournament, he really deserved to be drafted in maybe this year or next year. Because sometimes goalies don't get drafted right away in their first eligible year because of others that are overagers. So with that being said, Suhanek, I looked at him play for Czechia, and he reminded me a little bit of uh, Videk Vanacek. And his analytics match it up, and his skill set matches it up. And I can see him maybe doing a little bit more, because the way Czech goalies are, they are really solid in that, they're really sound mechanically, and I have an old co-host of mine who's a, uh, actually, yeah, on the Raising Hell in Jersey podcast, also my uh, co-host named Jake Wakeley. He's a former goalie, and he can, he always tells me about goaltenders, and the more I talk with him about goaltending, the more I pick things up, and <clears throat> I tend to like the way the European players are, but some of these guys actually come over to North America, kind of like following the Akira Schmid route, where they come and they play in the NAHL, they go to the USHL. And then they say, hey, I want to get drafted. I want to be part of this organization. So the way I like to think of uh, the teams going forward, they're going to look at goaltending. They're going to be like, I want that next best player. But going after goalies is a gamble. The Devils, however, took a couple of guys in recent drafts. Um, Tyler Brennan, he was my favorite North American uh, goaltender in this past draft in 22. And the Devils got him. And I was like, that's a solid pick. And yes, he plays for Prince George, but sometimes you need to play with a tough uh, program. That's hard. That's the, that's hard in that because when you see more pucks, you get used to all that uh, pain, and you you gain something from it. And when he comes up to, let's say Utica, and the Devils move on from another goaltender, they'll do just fine. And the way teams like San Jose they have to keep drafting goaltenders to see who pans out and fills in. Uh, the Ducks, who are rumored to moving goalie uh, like uh, like Gibson. John Gibson is really good, but the defense in front of him isn't doing any justice. And I've seen it over the years with the Devils where they had really good defense, but they've had little to no offense to put up for them. And then I've seen the reverse where they had no offense. When they had defense, they couldn't do anything to help out Corey Schneider nor Mackenzie Blackwood. And it's and you kind of just ruin the flow of a goalie's game. And when a goalie can't sustain momentum from the defense and getting timely goal support, it's hard mentally for them to want to keep playing and making desperate saves and stuff like that. The Devils have turned a corner 
knock on wood, in the netminder portion of it. They're starting to reevaluate the bottom six. And what does that mean? The Devils are, like I said earlier in the podcast, if you're in the playoff hunt and you have sufficient amount of assets, you want to improve your team, get ready for the playoff push right before March 3rd. You know, teams are going to be banging, saying, hey, can you help out, improve this team, and uh, be like, hey, we can do that. We can try and help. Uh, your team get better, you know, that's why teams look to make a real hockey trade. Well, let's see, Puck Empire. Let's see, per Darren Drager. William Nylander is probably getting up to Mitch Marner territory for his next contract. Not surprised. He does score a lot of points, a lot of goals. He's an all-star. Uh, Bruins and David Poshnok comp. Uh, continue to disagree on his value. Ooh. That means even though the Bruins are doing well money-wise, he might not want to stay in Boston. The Devils could be looking at him, but they also got to get Brat extended. So that's just a little bias for me. It says, Friedman wonders if C- the Seattle Kraken would be interested in Bo Horvat. Ooh. Ooh. You know, um, for me, that would be like if the Devils were to get uh, Mika Zibanejad playing both center and wing and having someone that could score clutch and power goals, that would be a wonderful thing for a team like the Seattle Kraken. My favorite Western team, why is that? Because I never really liked Las Vegas, the Golden Knights. And I work for a Seattle-based company, and I just really like the West Coast um, with Seattle, and I find that Seattle is a great market, other than the LA's, the Vegas's, Anaheim is a nice spot, don't get me wrong, but for those of you who do not want to go out to Texas or Tennessee or Arizona or Florida. From the from the time of this recording, they they still have a zero state income tax, so that is a benefit for those players that play in Seattle in Washington State. So that would be a good perk for Bo Horvat to save a little extra. Okay, so f- former New Jersey Devils athletic writer Corey Massasek says, does not think the odds are high that Timo Meyer will be with the Sharks next season. So he says, does not think odds are high enough. So when the odds are not high enough, that's not good enough. Why is that? I think the Devils are one of those teams looking at the San Jose Sharks for Timo Meyer. And I mentioned this before, that guys like Nico Heischer, Jonas Siegenthaler, all have this Switzerland East connection. And they played together internationally, and they all know each other. And it's only a matter of time if the Devils make the right offer. Plus, Meyer is owed a $10 million qualifying offer. So this might hurt the Devils' chances at a a David Pasternak. So if this is indeed true... Timo Meyer is likely on his way out. Now it says, Frank Saravalli thinks the Florida Panthers have a move in their back pocket for Sam Reinhart or Sam Bennett. I think they're looking at 
Sam Bennett because they are looking to buy off of a dipping Calgary team. And I mentioned it before, Calgary was a playoff team last year, but Sam Bennett looks like the type of target that they're going for. <clears throat> this one says, it feels like the relationship between Jakob Verana and the Red Wings is broken. Well, first off, his points production has gone down. His relationship in Detroit with Iserman is nothing now. It really has. And it's sad to see that. Let's see. Frank Saravalli. There is at least one team that has internally discussed trading for Verona. And then it goes Rory Boylan. Some teams have checked in with the Blackhawks on Seth Jones' availability. Well, here's the thing. If they trade Seth Jones right now, they're going to be asking for a lot of first-round picks and early picks as well so they can rebuild the team and stock up on really good players. And that's why I'm talking about these players now because teams like Chicago are in an arms race to tank. The Coyotes, Blackhawks, and Ducks are interested in taking on cap for assets at the deadline. Yep, that's called asset harvesting, draft pick harvesting. So, as I've said before on this podcast, that when you're doing very bad year over year and you're not going anywhere in the standings you're looking at guys like Callum Ritchie, Zach Benson Cameron Allen Delibor Dvorsky Charlie Strammel Nate Danielson Ethan Gauthier, Edward Schala Otto Stenberg uh, Colby Barlow Casper Holton all the way through uh, 16. I mean, we, we all know about the Connor Bernards, the Michkovs, the Fentilis, the Jaegers, the Carlsons. Those are the guys that are going to help make it easier for teams to sell early rather than sell at the deadline. And I think the NHL is going to change the percentage of odds for teams to win the draft lottery. They might go from one to two teams to one to four teams, but i rather keep it the one to two because at the same time, they should also visit the idea of having a uh, draft lottery tournament. So you take those draft lottery teams and you put them in a sweet 16, a do or die. And then... It goes into like a World Juniors, and you go and see those guys perform to get that pick. But that's just me being a little sinister. I'm Jersey Joe of Heads Up Hockey Podcast. You can find me from Spreaker.com all the way to Anchor.fm, Spotify, Apple Podcasts. Give me a thumbs up. Give me five stars. And I'm on Instagram, and I'm on Twitter, so I hope to see you all out there. And for those who like this podcast, share it around. It's 2023. We live in an information age. And by the way, I know I have new listeners in Washington State, New Jersey, Virginia, anywhere else I haven't heard. I heard that I have listeners in Quebec. So, merci beaucoup, au revoir, bonne nuit, thank you very much, good night, and goodbye, and see you next time.